Hello, friends. This is your host, Alex Costa. This is the AR Design Unholstered Podcast, episode 18. We are in Truth or Consequences, New Mexico. Um, one of my best friends, Dustin, owner of Coltac, asked me to join him on a wild Gemsbach Oryx hunt uh, just outside of Truth or Consequences. Um, we were guided by the wonderful Aaron Bad Luck Bauer. <laughs> um, Aaron is a world renowned uh, hunting guide and he guides in Mexico, New Mexico and Texas and uh, he does a plethora of hunts and he's extremely experienced in all the different hunts that he does guide on so we're gonna today we're gonna talk about pretty much the hunt uh, what got us here and what kind of motivated us to participate in this hunt we'll talk about the guns that we use during the hunt um, all the massive failures on my part preparing for this hunt and somehow yielding in the success of a, a, a tandem pair of, tandem uh, a pair of bucks, uh, bulls. We killed two bulls that Aaron has um, manifested the assumption that they're probably brothers because they were younger bulls. So um, we ended a bloodline. Sad, <laughs> but awesome. Out of all the times the fucking side by side rolls by is right now. <laughs> Introducing. Yeah. Anyway, uh, thank you so much for tuning in and I hope you all enjoy this wonderful podcast. Anyway, um, Aaron, you're you're a local here. Sadly. <laughs> no, don't say sadly. Okay, yeah. Dude, it's a beautiful area. Like there's a for as like desolate as this area is. <laughs> it's a perfect word. It's it's desolate. It's desolate. But there's a beauty to it that's like I'm sitting here looking out like at that oh, I don't know what peak that is over there, but like Turtleback. Turtleback. Like hey, that's beautiful. Okay. The the wonderful wilderness around here is definitely gorgeous. Yeah. There is a bleak sense of meth here though. I mean That's everywhere in middle right. America. There is. Uh, yeah. That's dude, middle of nowhere, New Hampshire. It's heroin in New Hampshire. I don't know if it's meth here. It's now. meth up up your way. For yeah. sure, meth here for sure. But but outside of that, like it's yeah. beautiful. It's it's absolutely gorgeous. Um, I haven't, other than going to Vegas, I've never spent time more than a, a fart in the desert. So it was really cool to um, chase chase animals through the desert. We didn't do it very long though. Yeah, one day <laughs> we got good. so we booked this hunt for four days, four yeah. days of hunting, and. Um, Aaron, you put us on a couple big animals right out the gate, but our approach in the vehicle up the two track, um, they saw us coming from two miles yeah. away and you mentioned they have 12 power vision. Yes. Is that a lie or is that actually? No, like... that, that's, that's, they say 10 to 12 power. Five. 10 um, to 12 power. But I mean, like I, like I told you guys, I've been two miles away from an orc that's staring at us and takes off running. That's crazy. I mean, like, their, their will to live is pretty, pretty insane. But. Well, I thought it was crazy as we were trying to – so the first two that we were trying to stock on, like, that one – the one seemed to not really care too much, yeah. but the other one, like, she knew that we were there. Yeah, I'm, I'm pretty sure she was in heat, and so that bull – like when we had seen him oh. running the the first time, when we saw him running, I'm I'm pretty sure she was on the other side of the hill. We'd seen him running over towards her, so like, and I think he wasn't he didn't worried care. about anything he other was than on something just else. being around her. Yeah, right. And he was trying to get it in. He kept he kept dropping his head down, smelling ground at like where she was standing there. When she walked forward, he went straight to that spot. So, okay. I, so she's either in heat or coming into heat. And these animals don't have a rut. They don't have a heat season. They can bear, two, you said they bear two calves or twins yeah. twice a year. Yep. They have the c capabilities of, or the capacity to birth twice a year. Yep. Um, you mentioned they have no patterns. They don't follow mm -hmm. game trails. They can walk in circles. Yep. So they're extremely unpredictable animal. So you really are left just to know the general vicinity that they operate. Traveling in. corridors, Traveling things that they corridors. like to eat at certain times. And the definition of, the of a corridor is, I mean, you know, like 
they like to stay in low bottom areas so that like where as a deer or an elk doesn't want to be in a draw or wash out to be moving they're wanting to be up higher so they can see things there's no predators for oryx out here so right. they like to be down low and not seen is that because it's cooler or there's more grass because the water goes down there or? just cover okay and wolves don't mess with them at all no I mean, maybe the calves yeah and and where where we're located at there where the orcs are at there's really not many wolves okay. like they haven't moved over there yet so coyotes mountain lions stuff like that only not predators that. we have in I mean, coyotes don't stand a chance, and the mountain lions don't go down low enough, typically. And they would only really take a pass at a, a really young calf, yeah. like a newborn. Yeah. And those calves aren't going to be up in the hills that young anyway. No. Well, no. I don't know. I don't know if I'm, I would think that a cow orcs, I wouldn't want to mess with one with a calf. I would think that it would try to oh, stab yeah. the snot out of a. No, you said, so they're non-typical antelope type in the family of antelopes but they're non-typical where the females are always fighting do the females fight males uh typically other females okay so they stick yeah. within their hmm. sex and fight so yeah. so you said females and it's fight. like a pecking order kind so of they're just trying like, to show who's yeah, boss exactly. in the area so there's an almost an alpha mm -hmm. female and then an alpha male yep in, in those in those communities of animals um, yeah, so then you also mentioned, uh, broken horns. Mm -hmm. Um, could you explain like the capacity of what a broken horn means in one of these animals and what it does to the animal? Yeah. So, I mean, with them fighting so much, you're going to have a lot of broken horn animals, but when they do break their horns, unlike a deer or elk, it doesn't grow back. So it stays broken and all the energy that typically is going into their horns starts to go into their body. So you're going to have an oryx with broken horns that's going to have a massive body. It's just going to look like a tank compared to one with full horns. might look drawn in almost compared to one that's got broken horns. Right. But, yeah, they're just, they're just aggressive animals in general. So you, uh, some of the things that I thought were really interesting is when you first got out there, we were like, what do we even look for? and they have a gray hide with black and white highlights. Uh, you mentioned they start to glow in the sun. Yeah. Uh, why is that? It just the, as soon as when the sun first comes up and it, it's like, it's like the warm color of them. So they'll it just catch that sun. Yeah. And they'll, okay. they'll glow kind of like an antelope, but as an antelope, it's going to glow very white. They're going to glow orangish color. Okay. Well, for an orcs. And what I thought was interesting too, like the first the first two that we were on, the one if they turned the right direction, they'd they shine just popped right out. Yep. And you know, right now there's a it's pretty green out here, right? So yep. like that helped yeah. contrast the contrast between, you know, the orangish grayish orcs versus the green background. Which usually doesn't happen out here. Usually yellow or gray in color. It's also right. the grain of the fur or the hair that I noticed. When they quarter away from you, they disappear real yeah. quick. Yeah. If they're a certain angle, they'll stand out. Right. But, I mean, they could be slightly quartered and they just disappear. Hmm. So how do they get here? They're an African Plains large antelope. Yeah. How do they get here? They were introduced, the state introduced them in, pretty sure it was the late 60s. The state of New Mexico or the federal government? Uh, I believe it was the state okay. that they had brought them in. And they worked a deal with the feds on putting it on, putting them on white sands. Got it. And so they, I'm pretty sure it was a hundred orcs that they had brought in initially. And they wanted to see how they would do. And within like 10 years, the population just oh, skyrocketed. And this goes back to they can bear calves yeah. twice a year. Yeah, two to four a year. Two to four a yeah. year. They have a high likelihood of twins. Yep. And they're just thriving here. You said they, they only drink water once a week. Once a week. Um, they, they get eat. enough moisture from what they're eating where the they don't need to 
Hmm. And their general diet is grass and weeds. Yeah. They, do they eat any of the low brush that was out there? A little bit. Some of the creosote bush or greasewood, um, prickly pear, yuccas, yeah, stuff like that. Yeah, greasewood, when we were sitting there skinning out. You could see the yellow flowers, flowers okay. inside of it. What, were the, what was the uh, bushes that were around us that had like little like blueberry-looking berries on that? That'd be greasewood. That's greasewood? Okay. Yeah. Cool. So and nothing super, else. Nothing else eats. Nothing that. else eats it. Yeah. So super hardy. They eat a diverse diet. Um, they they look the, the ones that we first got on were absolutely humongous. Yeah, they're really good orbs. The two that we shot, they were smaller, but they looked humongous when we glassed them. I yeah. mean, they almost deflate when you shoot them a little <laughs> bit. Like seriously. Yeah. Well, yeah, and I'm used to shooting whitetail that in an area that doesn't produce big whitetail. So like anything that has, you know, horns, antlers, you know, bigger than six inches looks like a monster. Regardless of size, their heads are huge. Their heads yeah. are Long their ears. Heads. And they, they, yeah. they've got almost mule type ears. Yep. Yeah. I mean, just goes to like that long nose, those big ears, those big eyes. Yeah. Like they're one of the tougher animals to hunt in the state of New Mexico just because of that. And that's so interesting. They just brought here, they were brought here on a whim just to see how they would do. I don't know who the guy was who, like, captured all those out. And said, fuck it, let's move them here? Yeah, let's put them on a plane. And they, I mean, I, I think they flew them here. And, oh, obviously. You had to. Well, I think they brought them from California, if I remember correctly. Huh. So there was a high fence ranch that they had been oh. brought from Africa and put onto this ranch. Okay. And then they were brought from there to here. So it's probably more of an overpopulated of ranch. Something was like, we have too many of these and not enough people shooting them. I I think the thing was, was that the state had found them there and was able to purchase them from mm. them privately since they were privately owned. Okay. And so then it was an easier trans transition process to be able to get it here. How many other exotics that are wild in New Mexico? So then the exotics that we have here are going to be your Oryx, your Barbary Sheep or Audad, the Ibex, and then there's a very small number of Himalayan tar in the state as well. And those Ibex are the Spanish area. Ibex, like the mm -hmm. Pyrenees Ibex? Yeah. Okay. Have you hunted any of them ever? Guided them. I've never hunted them myself. Try to put in for your tag and just never do I it? I don't even put in. Oh, really? Why not? I'm an odds guy. And uh, when you're bad luck Bauer, your odds are not yeah, but... looking too good. <laughs> <laughs> but if you don't draw, you don't pay for it, right? Like, Yeah. Uh, but I... They're a hard animal to hunt, I, Honestly, too. like, I just don't have this crazy boner to be out there hunting, okay. uh, you know, Ibex. Like, it's just, they, they don't do it for me. I feel like it's miserable. It, like, you got those rock, little plateaus out there. So, the mountain that they live on is called the Rock. That's what, oh. that's what it's referred to as the Rock. It's the Florida Mountains. And very Florida? unforgiving. Yeah. I always just said Florida. Yeah. So that's like a, a hoof and a hike and a camp. <laughs> like you're camping out there. There's, there's... Yeah, a lot of times what you're doing is you're glassing from down low. You're spotting them, and then you're make you're climbing this mountain all day to get to where you had last seen them. And those hmm. those animals can traverse 80 degree inclines on sheer oh, yeah. rock and not slip. They take naps while standing. Absolutely. Yeah, that's I I, I find the exotics. So that was one of the reasons why when Dustin was like, hey, do you want to do a wild exotic hunt in New Mexico? I was like, you know what? I like, I personally like hunting introduced or even considered invasive species at this point uh, that are non-native because, you know, I like the preservation of native species in America. But I think it's really cool that people do get the opportunity to hunt animals that are I mean, endangered, extinct, and other in their home countries and continents, but they're thriving in the diversity of North America and the United States. And I think it's really cool you that you have these opportunities to hunt animals that you normally have to travel three or four thousand miles and yeah. and never get to even eat them yep. because you can't fly home with, with the meat. meats from right. other countries. So you you know it's it's a real treat to to go out of your way to do these hunts and, and 
and to um, experience these opportunities because I mean there's only so many white tail mule deer you can <laughs> yeah you know hunting and then you got elk and and elk's cool but I and mean, a new adventure with it absolutely right. just new different country different techniques of chasing them you know I mean they're just they're just a different animal yeah so what got you into guiding like just a passion for hunting and i mean when when you're in a state that's draw only if you get one tag i mean you're only getting to hunt for a number of days and right. then it's done so i got into guiding so i could extend my hunting season it it's, it blows my mind that this part of the it, it's really interesting kansas you can draw certain deer here there's so much wildlife i can't believe that the residents have to draw to hunt but you got places like north carolina where you can shoot a a, a doe a day yeah. for whitetail right. but you do have a plethora of fauna out here yep. and as residents i mean that's hard on the residents that might use hunting as a means to feed their families you're in a not, place you're not um, hunting today is not about feeding your family that's not true there are poor ass people in north carolina that feed their family because they can shoot a doe a day in north carolina not out west i don't like but that's what i'm saying is you can't that i no i'm saying you can't do that because there's a draw here right well and i think people do it but it's not like that's not their main goal when they go out to do it when you sit there and you add up what it actually costs to do this like no, no, I understand that from a us coming from out of state and hunting this animal, even in state. But you know, I feel like, like let's be real, truth or consequences is a poor, very poor town. Yeah. Now, are there people here that if there wasn't a draw and they had the capabilities and the allowance to go out and hunt more animals without a draw system, do you think more people here would hunt to feed their families? It's just it's just honestly a goodness question because right. well, there are places up in those the Smoky also, Mountains where you can hunt all day fucking. But also long. land access, like it's private, yeah. so yeah, you don't have public land like the East Coast. Well, there's BLM, but still, I don't know. Mm. That's a tough question, and probably this guy, the guy, the locals, probably the better one. Though. Yeah, yeah, no, I mean it's tough. Like I mean, it... right now, what? <laughs> Poor people won't hunt because they can't do it. No, I no, I people. <laughs> but it's how it sounds. <laughs> that's not at all what I'm saying. I'm saying. That when you have a draw, when you can only shoot one, and meant, you're not, meant, you're not like, feeding a family off of an antelope a year. No, I'm not saying that. I'm saying if they didn't have the draw and people had the access and allowability to shoot more animals, would I, they? I think, I think it's like would a they? double-edged sword, though. I think like right. for in a, in a poor area like this. You know, hunting takes work, whether yeah. it's a draw system or it's over the counter, you know, it takes work. And a lot of, a lot of individuals I feel that are going off the system and living where they don't have to do anything. They're not looking to go do something to right. be bringing in food. And, you know, to, like, have to work for it. And that makes sense. It's also tough country. It's yeah. not like oh. in New Hampshire where if you happen to have a little piece of land behind you, you, there's a really high likelihood that animals are moving through your own property and you can shoot animals easily. I, I think it's just going to come down to an individual, right. ultimately, is just yeah. the, the type of person you are. Right. So now your ranch, I mean, we were talking about orcs, like, crossing and corridors. Like, is that localized to that section of property? Like, if you go 10 miles away, can you find the same corridors? Is it, like, just, is it luck that that's... I mean, it's going to be right place, right time, 100%. But, like, orcs are going to have a 35-mile home base. Oh, really? So, I mean, that they big? can cover 35 miles in okay. a couple of days if they wanted to. And, so, I mean, even just going off of game cams... I've had orcs that I see for a couple days, and I don't see them again for two months. Wow. And I could be out there glassing weekly and not see anything. Do they have Do they have uh, unique patterns on their 
horns or faces? Like, how do you? How can you tell? Like, I didn't see R2, that. R two R two looked completely different. Right. Well, but that was a shade. No, it, no, no, no. Mine that I yeah, thought have a the, black the ridge markings. across the back, and yours doesn't. Yours was a lighter really? shade of gray. Your face was lighter. Yeah. The behind the horns didn't have as much black as mine did. They they look like literally inverse opposites if you actually look at our two animals photos. Yeah, have to look closer. I know you didn't pay attention to none of that shit. Yeah, I don't, I don't pay attention. <laughs> They're all different, but I mean, like they've got that black line that comes up to their forehead. Yeah. Some connect, some don't. They have a black line that comes up by their ear. It's like a some, fingerprint. Some stays black. Some goes to like a golden color. Huh. I mean, they they all just vary. Do they all so have much. that thong in the back though? Mm-hmm. Yep. They have. I, I, they I, all got the thong. So. Um, Jorge took a video, a photo of it. He was like, yeah, there's a butthole. It's pooping still. Like, all right, let's take a picture. But, man, <laughs> for that hair to be so hard cut line, they have this yeah. triangle coming from their anus down between their legs, down their ball sack. And it's a perfect triangle. <laughs> no, it sounds it sounds grotesque. No, no. But it was something that was like my um, – I can't say I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> My OCD saw it, and uh, we'll call it OCD. And right. I saw it, and I was like, man, that's such a hard line. Like, almost like zebra-like hard line that's perfectly symmetrical coming down from there. Mm-hmm. And the hair where it changes is, like, perfect. And, and it looks painted on. It looks like yep. you taped it, you masked it with masking tape and hit it with spray paint. What, what's kind of crazy, though, is, like, when you think about a lot of African animals, they're kind of that way, though. Like the kudu. I mean, they've got very distinct, distinct markings. Zebra, impala, I mean, Gimsbach. Like, they, they're they just kind of a different animal, man. We're, like, our animals here, like elk, mule deer, like, it's completely different. Yeah, but animal pav. Animal pav. Animal yeah, do, but, but also, I think a lot of it is a short-haired animal like these African animals compared to some of these longer haired animals that we have, you're going to see that distinct, those distinct lines on yeah. that short hair compared to a long hair. That's like mangy looking. Yeah. And for everyone listening, when we're referencing antelope, we're talking about pronghorn, yeah. Yeah. which are actually a sheep, right? Uh, they're a goat. goat. They're, they're a goat. goat. Yeah. Okay. So they're a goat. Speed goat, but we call them antelope and antelope is actually a different, mm-hmm. what genus at that point. What do you, anyway i didn't pay way above my pay okay yeah. biology um <laughs> so yeah so we call them antelope in north america but they're actually a goat species and then uh and i've been calling them gemsbach not gemsbach so i've been saying it fucking wrong whole time. everybody says it different okay so, so. Uh, uh, gemsbach oryx they are technically an antel a true antelope species and like nil guy are the largest water dwelling yeah. um and so there are what? There's a shit ton of wild exotics in America. Yeah. Um, well, there's yeah. There's Axis, a, Nilgai. Um, there's oryx, a bunch of species. species. Orcs. Yeah. Well, and I, scimitar are those actually them. wild now? Like out of they, high fence? Oh yeah. Oh, yeah. They're, oh, yeah. They're, they're, they're in, in low Texas. fence. They're in low fence. Okay, so yeah. they are. Okay, so for those they're listening, they're free range. So you have free range scimitar oryx, which is in the same family as Gem, uh, Gemsbach oryx, but they're it, uh, their horns are significantly longer, curved. They're white, almost ghostly looking. They have like a reddish yeah, hind quarters. Longer horns? Oh, way longer. They they, they can. Yeah. yeah. Really? Yeah, they can be up to. And they're 50 curved, inches. hence the scimitar, like the curved sword. And um, and I did, and, and they those are extinct in the wild, Correct. but they are wild in North America. Yeah. Like huntable. Yeah. Grab a tag. And go shoot yourself up. because of Texas. Because of Texas, right? They they're yeah. still a huntable population of these animals. Well, yeah, and yeah, scimitar. So in Texas, it's a non-native species. Correct. So technically, with just a regular hunting license, yeah. anybody a can go fifty-eight dollar license. Right. Anybody can for, go and just for one. shoot one for unlimited. And, and unlimited. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So Texas. So like in where Texas. we were with Texan ammo, we could have shot Axis a day. Yeah. You could try to shoot as many as you want, but it's because of the landowners yeah. managing their own population. And, you know, legally, in the eyes of Texas, you can shoot as many scimitar orcs as you want. Yep. But because the landowners want to keep them alive for 
just good conservation pr- practices, yep. they don't, you know, and they, they control it on their own. And that's really cool. So, Dustin, what motivated you to seek out Aaron for an, an Oryx hunt? Like, why, why did you want to, why did you want to hunt Oryx? And, and what even, like, how did you even know or learn about, because I didn't know that Oryx right. existed in North right. America. So, I saw my first Oryx uh, when I, I was in the Air Force uh, down this way forever ago. And I... I, uh, your beautiful face. In the <laughs> so, yeah, I saw an or my first orcs 12, 14 years ago. Uh, saw it like physically or? Yeah, physically and from a helicopter. Okay. And as we were so, in the Air Force. Yeah, yeah. And saw it and I was like, dang, those, it, it, it was a whole herd of them. I, like, I still picture in my head, like, it was a whole herd of them and they were like, running across the desert i'm like oh my gosh cool how they run yeah and when especially they look like they're floating yeah yeah and i was up above them and like you just see them running across i'm like i want to go and hunt one of them and then you know busy and got moved you know i was transferred away yeah and then uh so it's kind of been in the back of my head for a long time and then i was actually i came down to texas uh back in december um i flew into el paso um, it's a good looking on, truck. Yeah. <laughs> it's a good looking truck. Lake truck. Yeah. I flew into El Paso with my dad for a mule deer hunt. And we had an extra day. So we drove up to the White Sands Missile Range to show him that area. And as we were driving out there, I saw an Oryx just standing on the side of the road. And I was like, and it kind of reignited that. And I'm like, oh my goodness. I got to try to like find one of these guys. And talking with people and ended up you know, getting hooked up with Aaron and then, you know, the rest is history. And That's awesome. So yeah. let's talk about white sands. So we shot two smaller bulls. We off range. Yeah. Off range. So off the, range. The, 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 during, if you guys are listening to the podcast, if you watch the YouTube video, you'll probably hear Aaron say off range on range. He's referencing on range being white sands missile mm-hmm. test test area versus off range which would be his property other properties public land public land yep so we are we've already decided dustin and i that we're going to come back and hunt with aaron next year and we're going to put in for uh white sands tags on range and how many tags do they give out a year for out of state for white sands um it's not many not many it's a tough draw yeah it's a tough so like, we're not going to tell you why what we're going to put in for because you guys can all fuck yourselves. We want to come out here uh, next year and actually hunt white sands, but, but the, the, the animals are bigger. Slim. Well, and, and the there's, are, m- there's more animals. There's more animals. So and less pressure because of the tags. Yeah. So the animals are bigger bodied. There's a higher there's a higher probability of shooting a larger animal than we did today because there's cause less there's pressure. More, you can pick just because you're going to see more. Like the ones that we had in the morning were both big mature orcs, close to four hundred I mean, pounds. Yeah, the okay. the bull that was in there was probably thirty seven inches, thirty seven and thirty six. For 37 people that inches. don't know what that means, what does the inch length mean? What's the measurement it, of inches? Yeah, so it'd be the overall length of the longest one horn or just, one horn. Okay, and so of just one of the horns. Um, so I mean, like for a mature bull, 32 inches is about standard. I mean, that's kind of an average size Just under three fucking feet uh, for a mature bull. And, and they sharpen those horns. They sharpen. Yeah. They're constantly, how do they sharpen them? Mesquites, uh, yuccas, definitely yuccas in, I mean, just like a bull elk breaks their horns on trees to get dagger you know yeah. jesus i, I mean to to get rid of their velvet and to get color on those horns and sharpen them and polish them up oryx polish their horns constantly and they're as they're growing they're like splintering off outer layers and as they continue to get more and more polished yeah and i noticed that on ours 
it was a little bit rounded, but you could tell they were rubbing yeah. oh, the yeah. tips of their yep. horns on stuff. And um, both of our animals, the right side horn is longer than the left, left. side. And we don't, we don't have an answer for why. Genetics. Genetically. Is and, the that, I think of. and that might be, so Dustin's bull, the horns turn out a little bit. And I did see a photo, I, I described this to the, the group earlier, but I saw a photo of uh, a herd of oryx walking towards the camera person and it's almost like a fingerprint every horn set is just slightly different yep. it's almost like a fingerprint you can tell the difference between the animals but um because the the horns are are asymmetrical on both animals is that also a testament that they're probably related yeah i mean they're just it, it's so hard to say but i i feel like the two bulls being together. same size, same age class being together like that, more than likely were brothers and a couple pounds are, difference. Yeah. Too. I yeah. mean, yeah, very They're, little difference. Now I know with like white tail does will sit there and run off their, their buck fawns like, and they say it's cause of like to prevent <clears throat> inbreeding and bucks will chase off, you know, like they seem like they try to scatter their offspring to try to help with yeah. inbreeding. Yeah. Like that's a genetic dis. That's a amazing genetic disposition too. Right, but I, you know, what makes me wonder, like with these, you know, if if they are brothers, like were they born in this area? Were they born, you know, this, sixty they miles could have been south, forty miles away? Right, and and you know, got kicked out of the herd that they were in and are and found a new home made a little bachelor herd dirty. right yeah that's yeah like uh, and, that, and that's like that's whitetail whitetail do the yeah they do they'll that start same. the young ones will make their own little herds right well see right. another thing that was on my mind earlier today when we were skinning out the heads was like on the one head you could see that had that gouge in its yeah below its eye mine right correct okay and there was another one that on it was yours i noticed in like right here, that there was a big pus pocket. That was a real fresh pus pocket from being uh, stabbed. stabbed from another horn. Well, going back, it's like if that one mature cow that was with that old bull that we had seen in the morning, right? We had seen another oryx that was running in that same area. If that cow was in heat, those two bulls could have came over and got beat up and are just staying in the general area and that other one got ran off so that right. one bull is just he's the dominant know, yeah That's... and so it's like those two bulls could have been trying to get with that cow and just got their asses kicked and pushed back out hmm. and they were just staying in the area yeah right. just maybe i get a shot yeah Plus, man i find i that's like thinking about how incredible these animals are to ad adapt to certain environments and i mean these guys were built for this type of environment obviously but like i don't know i don't i don't know how anything survives in this kind of and, and like and like we were talking you know you're here at a time where we've been having one of the wettest summers in like 12 years right. 14 years probably like we've been in such a crazy drought that antelope have died off and deer have died off and these oryx have just thrived in with having nothing out there when did when did they start opening uh out of state hunting out of state over the counter tags for them because like we got so, our tags at walmart <laughs> yeah we yeah. literally bought our tags yeah at walmart. so they started doing over the counter tags in 08 okay oh wait in I had put in for like 13 years and never drawn a tag. So I've killed multiple orcs now and they've all been on my ranch except for one. I've drawn one on off range. range. Oh, awesome. I still haven't drawn my on range Do you tag. put in every year? Oh yeah. Every huh. year I put in. So I've put in for 17 years for on range and I've wow. never drawn out. Really? Yeah. That's wild. So that's, that's why I say like with the over-the-counter tags, it just, it's just a game changer in the sense of being able to have an opportunity to go and hunt them. Yeah. Right. Because your odds of drawing 
your on range tag's just so little and so slim. So I didn't realize that you seventeen years mm -hmm. you've been putting for on range and never got one. Yeah. So wow. so our tags, out of state non res tags for Oryx are um sixteen hundred dollars, which yeah. is so at the end of the day, I've always looked at Zach Hine, formerly a CZ, now at Weatherby. Yep. He always told me every year I buy my local stuff in New Hampshire, I buy every tag in existence because that goes to conservation. Yeah. So for me, paying for a sixteen hundred dollar tag to hunt one of these amazing animals is going to the conservation in New Mexico. Now a resident tag is what, one sixty. Yeah. So as a resident of New Mexico, you can hunt one of these amazing animals get guided by Aaron and it's only 160 bucks, wow. which is that's not just for the tag. That's just yeah. for the tag. No, I meant we're, we're yeah. talking about the tag, right? You got to lay off the tequila, bro. Uh, we're just talking about the tags right now. Have so, another sip. Yeah, yeah. Have, have more. Just drink the <laughs> bottle. Um, so that's, that's really like for me, if I was a New Mexico resident, I would be motivated. That's the pound, the price per pound on just yeah. a tag not including guide services, obviously, yeah. but the price per ta pound on a tag is 100% worth the experience oh, in the hunt. Absolutely. And we're out here going, fuck, we're, we're saving our piggy bank to go do this because it's such a unique experience. You know, obviously the price per pound fucking is yeah. uh, orders of magnitude greater, but it was something that we both said, fuck it, we really want to experience this. And it's something that you can experience in North America and not have to go to Africa, Africa to right. South Africa. Or high fence in Texas. Right. You know. And I I know there are high fence areas in Texas that are like so huge that you might not see an animal. Absolutely. But personally for me, I like hunting introduced or invasive species, uh, not high fence because for me, just I guess not in an ethical manner, but in an integrity manner, I want to hunt not on high fence ever. Yeah, I, I personally, that's just the one thing I don't yeah. want to hunt a high fence hunt. It, I don't it, look at I don't look at people who do it differently though. Like if if people want to do it, that's fine. That, that's fine. It's their money, right? Uh, uh, but I would rather hunt a wild animal and learn wild terrain. Uh, and, and it doesn't matter. There could be really good high fences in America, but at the end of the day, it's still those animals can't leave that property. Right. And these animals can go wherever the fuck they want, travel right. wherever the fuck they want. And they are truly yep. wild yep. animals. 100%. And, and for me, that means a lot more to be able to shoot. Even though we shot smaller bulls, uh, Dustin and I are super close. We're really good friends. And it was very special to take our bulls at the same time. Same time. Um, but let's talk about what we learned uh, with guns and distance and dope. Because we, I literally just lit that one and that one went out. Huh. You fucking <laughs> asshole. Um, so... I've been, I went on a hunt in Idaho last year with CZ and because the gun that I was hunting with with CZ released, a, like the gun came into the country a couple days before I prepared for my hunt. Um, I last minute prepared for my hunt and it, you know, it, it w I would have shot an animal if I had an opportunity, but it didn't work out. Right. Yep. Not to make excuses, I bought this 300 wind mag last year when uh, after I got back from my Idaho hunt, I was like, oh, a guy had an X-Bolt. It's going to be a decent gun, but I bought ammo for it from SIG. I didn't test ammo <laughs> five days. <laughs> I tested ammo five days before I shot. It didn't like the 180. It liked the 190. Um, I, I, I got a, it took six months to get the rail for that gun from Warren, Warren, Warner, Warren, Warren, Warren. Warren. and it took forever to get the rail and um and then i was playing with glass and i ended up putting a competition match glass 7 to 35 on which actually was great having the extra power did you wh what power did you have it on when you shot did you have it at 35 no okay I was no i say. had it like at 17 power oh okay i, was uh, say, I had it at like, 17 because aim small 35 <laughs> no no aim small miss small i had it at 17 yeah, yeah, yeah. power at 339 yards so Dustin and I took our animals at 339 yards. We took them in Minus tandem. Further. Yeah, because yours ran. Yeah. Um, I shot first. 355. He he followed so up. I had to throw it in. <laughs> you were shooting 6.5 PRC. Yep. Uh, your gun, you spend time building out a really nice gun that can pretty much kill any horned animal in North America. 
yeah. and it's a fairly light. I probably wouldn't do that stock personally because it's kind of heavy. Yeah, Manners carbon fiber, dude. I have a Manners carbon fiber on a twenty-two, and it's eleven pounds. Anyway, <sighs> okay. <laughs> so I went with a really lightweight gun because I planned on doing yeah. another like Frank Church deep deep forest uh, elk hunt. So I wanted something super light that didn't need to go out to real big yeah. distance. And Aaron, prior to the trip, said. Be capable of making a 400-yard shot. Did you say that, or did Derek tell me that? Derek probably told you that. I don't know. Now I, I, I tell people your average shot's 400. So. Oh, my God. That's completely different from right. what I had in mind. And see, and this is where, like, the more I've been thinking about this, like, I think it was a game of telephone. Like, I don't know. I think no, looking that, back at our conversation, you were saying average is 400. And I want to say what. And I don't know now. So next Derek, time I'm never going to listen to you. I feel like you. Derek typically tells people to, to shoot, plan to be shooting 400 yards. Right. Because you're going to be anywhere from two to 600 yards. You know what he told me? Shots. Max 400. Mm. He told me Game of telephone. max Game of telephone. 400. So now I have your phone number and <laughs> fuck this guy. Just don't send me dick pics. Because I, oh, that's, that's inevitable. It's already <laughs> happened. Check your phone. <laughs> I know. But, but does, I kept going, taint can you, pictures. can you ask, I kept pictures. going, can you ask Aaron more questions? Like, what do we need to be prepared for? You had his number? No, I didn't. Yes, you did. It was on the contract. It's on the contract. It doesn't matter. I mean. Look at the contract. <laughs> you were the liaison because you, I know. You, you ordered it. You gave me all this, like, this is what, why is this Will Wells lit up? Because he he's fucking dope, dude. He's dude, dope. dope as fuck. He's, he's, <laughs> He's lit. He's lit. He's tight. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so, tight. Y- you know, you could, oh, no, max 400 yards. And I'm like, all right. So I'm sweating. I buy these, like, beautiful, like, E-tip, Nosler, SIG, 180s. And the gun doesn't like it. I'm panicking. My lab radar isn't fucking getting the right muzzle velocity. i panicking because, and, and this is a bad excuse. I had surgery. I have a new hunting puppy. I've just been dealing with life shit. And a sore taint. We get. I had surgery <laughs> in an area that's very uncomfortable. And no, I don't have a pylodial, pylondial cyst or whatever. But um, long story short is, I probably should have like asked more questions, done more research on. I didn't know we were gonna do this hunt, right? And so we were. We originally planned this hunt in the spring, and Dustin and I both moved our shops at the yeah. same time, and we postponed the hunt. Yeah, yeah and, we were supposed to do this first week of May. Yeah, yeah. first week of May. And we both postponed the hunt because of our the moves of our shops. So we moved it to this. And, you know, I I guess let's call it lackadaisical. I was like, oh, it's okay. It'll be all right. And I made the mistake of rushing things again. The glass worked out. The shot worked out. I had perfect shot placement for a quarter away animal. You double lunged and had an exit. And hard. You, yeah, it was, um, it was. It was Perfect play. Double, long, shots yeah. were... Double long heart shot. Mine went through the back of the rib cage forward into the kill box. Both animals died. Yeah. Like, like within 30 yours. yards apart. Yeah. Well, yours was dead when you shot it. Right. It just had no idea it was dead. It, right. I mean, I mean, it. when we walked up on it, the horns were tucked underneath Under, it because yeah. it flipped over. On its own neck. Yeah. Mine, so 300 went on lightweight. I used your sticks. Yeah. He had his own tripod. Yep. Um, and I locked cause I was magged in at like 17. So when I popped my shot, it took me probably three seconds, probably, it probably took 1.5 seconds, but it felt like an eternity yeah, yeah. to find the animal again. And when I finally got glass on and you told us, be prepared to shoot again. Yep. Um, so the second I popped that shot, I didn't, because of the recoil, I didn't even see where I hit on the animal cause yep. I wasn't managing recoil cause it's three on wind on the knees on hunt six. Uh, they were a little up. high. They yep. were a little high for me too, where yep. I was kneeling. And, um, you said your your animal's down, and I was like, so I still ran the bolt because you told us be yeah. ready. And then by the time I got back on it, I was gonna pop another shot just to make sure. But you were like, no, don't even worry about yeah. it. That animal's dead. I, I was trying to tell you not to shoot again until Dustin to start shooting. <laughs> right, and everyone was deaf because I had an unsuppressed rear wind <laughs> yeah. bag, and yeah. I we you know through the business we have like sixty eight cans, and I'm an asshole and didn't put a bring a suppressed gun. Um, so, you know. I learned a lot, right? Well, because I, I wasn't I wasn't doing a sponsored hunt from like CZ where I had to run some shit. Uh, this hunt, I learned so much from this hunt between capabilities of weapon systems, type of glass, the type of hunt it is, and I I personally have decided I want to build a lightweight, high end twenty eight yeah. nosler with good glass 
that can shoot out to a grand and ethical have enough ethical energy to kill anything in north america out yeah. to 800 yards let's say on a huge elk or something like that yeah. and um we're coming back next year to hopefully like regardless we're coming back to yeah. shoot something hopefully we can you can get drawn out drawn out on on range yeah and but if not i didn't realize it was that difficult and yeah. if not we're gonna go off range and chase animals for as long as it takes to get a real big one yeah Folks, 40, 46 inch. 46 inch world 46 record. Inch. Between the two horns, we could oh. probably do that. T- tandem <laughs> kill, though. It has to be it has the same. To be tandem again. It has to be a tandem kill. But which is pretty awesome, though, to be able to. Yeah. I mean, once when we when we saw that oryx, you know, we thought the there first was one. only one. And when we put a stock on, we got to that like one stood up, like three hundred sixty yards, maybe. Then it was like, oh shit, there's two of them. There. Right, right. And so, you can see the other one through that mesquite bush. When we first started going, and it was Alex's turn to give it a shot. And I was. Why I, was that? Why was that? Why was it my turn to give a shot? I, I, <laughs> I, 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 I made him pull the trigger on some wild <laughs> shots. So, our first two animals in the morning, uh, we were chasing them, chasing them. And, and so, respectfully, if I had a capable firearm right. and Dustin had dope past 400 because he thought the max shot would be far. i headed out to 550 to, as like just a fail safeguard, safe. a fail <laughs> yeah safe. 550 so, so if we knew the minimum the minimum average was 400 right. i would have done a completely different Same gun yeah. you would have had dope out yeah and we would have both had high-end carbon fiber tripods and we were ready we to in, go yeah, so yeah, in the yeah. morning we got in within 739 yards i glassed it we would have both taken those animals if we had the, if you were prepared for right. those conditions. Right, if we conditions. were prepared yeah, for yeah, those yeah. conditions, which now I am never not going to be prepared. Like, yeah, I'm right. going to build yeah, yeah, that yeah. 28 yeah. Nosler that can do that. And when you're like, oh, there's, they're 800 out, I'll be like, nope, let's do it. Fuck it. Right. Yeah. Well, and that's, yes. So looking back, I should have been more prepared for those types of shots. And it's okay. But what I was going to say, when we saw the one and we thought it was just one, I almost asked the question, like, should I just leave my rifle here because there's only the one and Alex is going to go after it. And in my head, it's like, uh, I'll bring it just in case. Because it's usually the case of if I don't oh, yeah. bring it, yeah, I need always it. need it. Yeah. And, if you know, when I do bring it, I'll never need it. But no, it was so cool just because once once we noticed that there was two, right. it's like, okay, there's two of them now. <laughs> like, right. We can, like, got you set up. And once you got set up, then I was telling you, like, get over here to yeah. the left. Get, like, let's both get you guys right. set up. And, and poor Jorge was putting his ears on <laughs> and didn't realize that we were both going to shoot. Right. <laughs> yep. Sorry, Jorge. <laughs> and um, so, no, but yeah. next time we're going to be very capable. We're going to have the correct equipment. I even said next time I come out, it's going to be an arc rail clamped on, yeah. rifle over shoulder, I'm... tripod and running low. And, and we're going to be much, much more ready. And yep. I think. Honestly, this hunt for me, and the reason why I love this hunt so much is this is going to be preparing me for so many more Western big yeah, game hunts absolutely. moving forward. Now, I want to build a do-it-all in North America, shoot anything that fucking moves, that has <laughs> horns in North America, that's light enough weight, that has the capabilities to do distance, and, and have ethical put-down energy yeah. for the animal. And I, you put the bug in us, man. It's good. We we're coming out next year to do this. Absolutely. Yeah. Looking yeah. forward to it. I mean, that was and it, this was a super special hunt. This yeah. is our first time hunting together. Right. Well, I mean, we did like pheasant. We play, did pheasant. placed pheasant. <laughs> yeah. It was, it was an upland club. We paid for birds to get yeah. put out. That was the only time we like hunted together. We've shot competitions together, but. So Dustin and I, Dustin motivated me years ago to start shooting PRS competition. I remember um, taking you out to John's house for the first time and yeah, you were like. With my 260. Yeah, and you were lost like a little puppy. And now you kick my ass at matches and I'm pissed. It's because I've always been a better shooter than you. I just bullshit. applied my, uh, bullshit. I, applied my yeah. I applied my fundamentals to long gun and now it's my favorite thing ever. But no, but let's talk about that real quick. We shoot competition together. You've yep. been hunting your whole life. Yep. I haven't. I started hunting four years ago, five right. years ago. So Dustin owns Coltac. Dustin and I are good friends. We met years ago. Dustin makes precision rifle equipment, hunting equipment, suppressor covers. Yeah. Uh, he's a big dick freak. Um, wow. He, I've never had that title before, but I'll so, take it. So he's, <laughs> he, he was the one that really inspired me to be like, yo, you're a great shooter. You have 
guns that are capable. Why don't you shoot PRS? And it that was that was kind of scary. It was a lot of information, but you know, I have an engineering background. I found it fascinating. I started well, calling it golf with guns. Right. Well, and that's I think we both kind of have the same thing where we're both kind of nerdy, sciencey type people, but we both like guns. So like with long range shooting, you get to mix science and shooting together with all the variables. And it's like, that's what. And apply capabilities with science. Right. And so that's why I really like it. And so I knew you would like it. And I remember taking you out and like, Hey, let's go shoot, you know, out past. I think what you said, you shot like 200, 300 yards before that. 300. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, 300. 300. And then it was like, out at John's, it was, I think, 880. It was his longest. And nine, nine, ten, nine, ten. Whatever. At yeah. the little guys in the back. Yeah. And so, you know, and then you kind of got the bug. And then going to your first match, I remember you were like. Oh, I made every mistake in the world. And you were a nervous Nancy. I, 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 no offense to Gorilla. Gorilla is a decent ammo company. But they sold. I you were shooting Nexus. No, on my 260 originally. Yeah. But then when I started shooting matches, I did a Kelby's build. And I'm like, oh, I'm going to have to move through barricades. So I need an 18-inch 6.5 Creed more. Yeah, that's right. And then right. I started shooting Gorilla. And yeah. they, they advertise it as a 20-inch match least. ammo. And their ammo died so fucking fast in a hurry. And then out of an 18-inch barrel. Right. And I was I like, why that. didn't I listen to people that, you know, I thought I knew best. Yeah, and I made yeah. every mistake in the world. But and uh, Lucas learn. Mason was like, yo, you want to shoot factory? Gold medal match, 6.5 Creedmore is hot as fuck. It's a yeah. 130 burger. And you can melt targets with it. And I've actually, I still shoot that. And I yeah. do really well. Um, but anyway... So I've been shooting competition for a few yep. years now. Um, I've done well. You've done well. And hunting for me is one of those – I'm I'm a, a, a range shooter mm. traditionally. I'm a tactical shooter. And then um, Zach Hine took me on my first hunt, which was a bird hunt, and gave me the hunting bug. And um, I've done pig hunting at night with night vision in Texas. And I think the only time you can really test your capabilities as a shooter is – hunting well regardless of the animal like well because your adrenaline i mean all all the different factors and variables that go into it compared to range shooting right it's just completely different well and what's interesting and you'll have to play it back because i'm i'll remember remember this clear as ever we were we were up on the orcs and I, so we, you were like, I'm going to take the left one. And I, so I was zeroed in on the left one as well in, in my glass. And Aaron's like, all right, go and take them. So, you know, you, I think it was like, should I shoot him? And it was like, shoot him now. Play back the video and you can yeah, hear. Yeah, because he, he turned right. a little bit and you should, and I was like, I said to shoot. And you're like, I, I said, shoot he's him broadside. Now. I said, he's broadside. Should I shoot? And you said, shoot him now. Yeah. And he, and he turned instantly. Yeah, you're right. And then, and then I remember, I remember hearing you go, <sighs> like, which, you know, during competitions, like I don't do that. You 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 know you try to find a, a you know your your would not not to that extreme. I've I've never breathed. Try right. to do breathing in competitions. Right. I just no, I know. pump shots, dude. <laughs> right, but like I could sit there and 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 I could tell like the way how you breathe, you could I could tell that there was also an element of stress and adrenaline going in you. Dude, which my I, reticle was bouncing a foot on that animal. <laughs> right. It's so different. It's so different. And so that's where, like, yes, competitions help you for this. But, like, because you can't replicate that adrenaline pumping, like. My heartbeat was like, duh, duh. And you know what? I'm glad I took that breath. Right. Because, so competitions, I'm kind of, I don't do all your fundamentals when I shoot competition. Even, like, when you're doing a lot of movement, I'm really good at that figure eight movement of your reticle. Sure. So I'm good at. Oh, you see that that reticle drop, and I know where my apex bottom of my drop is, and as it's coming up, I press that shot. Because when I was zeroing that gun, I had very little confidence in this firearm because I didn't test different loads to see what pattern best at distance. So the 190 grain SIGs that I had ended up doing the best, but at 400, I was shooting a four-inch group um, during zero, and for me, that's unacceptable. But... For the size of the animal at the distance shot, that's totally acceptable. And with, but what's crazy on like when you talk about that, I get people that come out and they're like, "I hit a fucking piece of plywood at a hundred yards. I'm good to go." It's mm. like, yeah, I mean, right. 
there's there's you know a whole I mean? range. We hold ourselves to an extremely I, I, high but, standard. And though. that's the thing, is because of being a PRS shooter and doing this stuff, you know, accuracy is everything to you guys. Yes. Right. And and grouping in ninety percent of hunters. They shoot their gun once a year. They'll, right. they'll take it. Oh. They, they won't even go shoot their gun. But like, I take people out that, oh, yeah, you know, my 1966 30-06, you know, I, I used it eight years ago on a deer hunt. Well, how's it shooting now? Won't won't be any different than it was six years ago. It's like, well. Jesus but maybe you are. You, yeah. The, the, the rifle, I mean, and the rifle hasn't changed since then, but. Your but eyes you know, do. You're not being behind that glass, right, exactly. Squeezing that trigger and doing the stuff. It every year that stuff's going to change with you as an individual. Right, your eyes are changing yeah. all the time. So I mean, like taking you guys out was one of the worst hunts I've ever had. But <laughs> <laughs> you son of a bitch. Yeah, no, I mean it, it I'm was glad it's over. Not. Not only did were you locked in my back seat for probably half of the hunt. <laughs> Thanks for taking out some lemon. You're, you're yeah. Welcome. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to sue as well, so don't worry. <laughs> yeah, Mexican Ford? Okay, yeah. Get, yeah, it's a Lobo. <laughs> wow. <laughs> but, yeah, I mean, it's, like, we had a great time. And, yeah. But, like, when it came down to it and we, the shots had to be made, the shots were made. Now, and they were placed perfectly. Now, how confident how much confidence did you lose when you put him on your hood on moving animal so for everyone watching zero okay uh, so there was uh, a moment in the first morning yeah. wait first what am i saying first morning we shot our animals in the afternoon right um in the morning we stocked those animals yep. they were at 739 so if we again if we both had capable uh guns or you knew your dope you had a capable gun i didn't right my 65 prc would uh, i feel confident out to that distance. to a grand to yeah, to a grand, I, I would feel fine. Ethically. Ethically. And that's what... So what's hard, what, <laughs> no, what, but, that, but But if if we if I had a gun that had equivalent, I had the equipment, and I brought the equipment, you and I could have set up on tripods sure. and fucking so, smoked both those animals. Right. With cans on? Yes. Like... All day. All day long. Like, right. I mean, there could have been multiple attempts. Right. And, with and cans multiple on. impacts. And I will brand. say, I... And, and this is something that I'm still trying to get used to because, you know, my history with hunting is really close range whitetail hunting. And only taking shots that you know can ethically kill the animal. Well, it's it's taking shots at 40 yards on a on a whitetail. Compared to 650 yards on right. the hood and of a truck. On but... the hood of a truck. So, like, I'm, okay I'm not used that to that. Too. Well, I'm okay with that, but I... You know, and a, but not being standing still, broadside. Right, and it was and, and it was you rushed, it. And, yeah. and it was rushed. So like, and, and they that, were moving. They, and were, they were moving. They were like so like, full clip. Right. Yeah. So if I would have, and, and they, was were, more, they were like three fifty out when we first parked. No, three fifty. They were they were, they were like five fifty. Five fifty parked. And his first shot was maybe six fifty. Oh, right. okay. Right. They, they they were pokes. Right, and and like. If I would have, now going back, like if we had to replay that knowing. You would have listened to me. I would have listened to you. And <laughs> well, honestly, you would have shot. But, I, but no, no, you're like, and you're like, all right, we need to go now. And I, and in my head, it was like, okay, we're going to like try to stock up further. I didn't realize when you said we're going to go now, it's like, put the fucking gun on the truck and like start Well, no, you put lobbing. your tricorn bag on your Coltac. Yeah. Coltac, Coltac manufactured tricorn bag. Brought to you by Coltac. And you put it upside down. Uh, you put it upside down on the hood. Yeah. And which I'll be that, purchasing. When you put that down on the hood, I was like, oh, he's going to fucking shoot. And I got pumped. And you put your gun down and then you turn to Aaron. You're like, okay, what? Yeah, and I know. You know, I know. He's yeah. like, fucking shoot it. And you're like, oh, um, wait, really? Yeah. Yeah. I'm bang and when we saw dust and he was like shoot it again and you're like i don't fucking know what the fucking range is and right. i only know dope out to 550 i'm a guess and he took another shot and, and it, was it was six low. feet low yeah. Yeah. behind the animal and then you were just like i'm as not moving right. and like, you were also like as i'm telling him to shoot yeah and then yeah. you're like nah this is i can't i'm not right. doing this and but again we there was telephone there was uh miscommunication right but next time we we could take Dude. up to a grand yeah, and be wow. successful. Yeah, wow, one hundred percent. What to expect? And I'm used right. to shooting like twelve inch targets at a G. I'm used oh, to shooting yeah. twelve inch targets at a G. Their kill box on these animals is like two feet technically. You can yeah, double lung absolutely. one. Absolutely. So 
moving forward, our hunt next year. Yeah. Like, if you put us on 400 pound animals at 750 yards, yeah. it's gonna be a no brainer. Right. We both set up with canned guns and fucking drop, yeah. drop bulls right. or cows, yeah. and and we can shoot both. You can shoot both. Yeah, there both is no, of them have there's no difference. Both of them have horns. Yeah. As both far as of tags them fight. Go. Yeah. And both of them are fair game at the same time. And and you did you say that the females can get bigger? Yeah. So really. So yeah. The cows will have thinner horns and can typically be longer, and bulls will have more mass and typically shorter. Okay. So like a cow, average cow is gonna be like 34, 35. Bulls like thirty one, thirty two. Hmm. Um, so I mean, if you shoot a cow thirty four plus like you're shooting a good cow 37 is a really good cow that's awesome and bull same way like 34 inch bull is a good bull cool Hmm. so this was great this was we we um we quartered our animals yesterday evening we put them in game bags we got them on ice this morning we deboned deboned them uh we Aaron skinned the, the skulls for us because these were smaller bulls. We decided we we're going to euro mount them. Yep. We bagged them, taped them, put them in the refrigerator. They're here in the refrigerator at our Airbnb. beautiful single wide trailer Airbnb. <laughs> Airbnb. This is actually a. a it, it, it works it's awesome. Nice. It's, it's really clean, nice. It's actually clean, nice. bug free. You each, well, each of us have our own mini split. Um, so I would much rather be in this than a hotel. Yeah. For sure. Um, I can shit in peace. Um, shit. So, we and we have we're doing laundry. We, yeah. So we have we took all the we took all the shelves out of the uh, the refrigerator and put just the skulls put in there. Skulls. Just to put the skulls in there. Um, I did call. I made six phone calls today trying to see. I was going to bring my skull home, and I'm glad I called taxidermy before I decided to get a cooler big enough to bring the skull home, because uh, New England there's apparently a season on taxidermy. <laughs> Right, um, and only, now is not it. And now is not it. So uh, Dustin's taking my skull home to get taxidermied in South Dakota, and then I'll and he's going to ship it to me, and um, I will be bringing the meat on the airline. So people that don't understand, you can go travel and hunt and bring game home. I have literally taken a soft REI cooler with uh, six pheasant and and fifteen quail, like feathered full quail. <laughs> From Kansas as a second carry-on on the flight, and TSA doesn't bat an eye. No, um, you can buy a cooler in state, shoot your animal, debone it, put it on ice, literally bring it to the airport, and it comes out your check bag luggage, check bag. Yeah. and yeah. and it saves you a lot of money because yeah. I did shoot in Axis in Texas uh, earlier this year, and to have it shipped, and I I regretfully should have. Bought a cooler because it was deep frozen, mm-hmm. already vacuum bagged. It would have cost me seventy five dollars to bring to New Hampshire. Yeah. I paid seven hundred dollars yeah. to ship ship, ship yep. it back, and that was fucking ignorant. Yeah. So if you are doing these uh, out of state hunts and you're trying to save money and you want your price per pound to make sense to bring it home, fucking buy a cooler in state fly and it. bring it back. Yep. Fly it with you. Yeah, that's when I was in Texas mule deer hunting. That's I flew back with like one and a half mule deer because my dad just he didn't you know want that much deer. He didn't want that much deer. My mom and him won't eat it, so he gave me half of his. And I just bought cheapo coolers at Walmart, taped the snot out of them, and flew with it, and that was the way to go. And TSA still cuts them open, but they'll tape them back up yeah. a bit. But what's interesting, you know, and you talk about flying back with with horns or antlers, like they're both approved carry on items so like i've got this picture of me with my backpack and this i remember you know, that you had, did you put noodles on it i put i duct taped the i duct taped the points uh of the the antlers because at first i was going to try to put it in my checked bag but it just it was too wide to fit in my suitcase right. so like that was a carry-on that was my carry-on i literally it was strapped to the outside of my backpack and in the el paso airport like people were looking at me like some people were looking at me like there was some like you know, ladies who were looking at me, and they're like, they kind of shook their head. And then there were some guys like walking past, like, give me the thumbs up, like, heck yeah. 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 You know, so it's funny to see. But yeah, like sitting on the outside, because like it, they were so wide. Yeah. I couldn't, 
like I I couldn't put them in. I didn't have a bag. Big How did enough. you fit them in the check bag? Like the overhead. I just put them in. They fit. Oh. Okay. They cool. fit. I yeah. Mean, an Oryx skull would fit in the overhead, which is interesting. Yeah, you could do it. Um, I I um. I but mine was just capped, like because I'm getting a a, yeah. a full mouse. They just yeah. took. Oh, okay, okay. So I didn't have. The, so I didn't have the, skull cap. With it was the yeah. skull, skull cap, cap with, with the, the antlers. antlers. Okay. I um I flew back with a which a three hundred pound pig skull, in a it was it was a warm and fuzzy duffel like the little short little two foot duffels. And I had like my thermal in the bag. And the skull taped up in two trash bags, and man, I get I get pulled over and almost cavity searched for a box of business cards. But night vision, radios, batteries, and a I, and, skull. And I have my batteries in magazines. There's a magazine battery dispenser yeah. that I carry. A skull and like scopes and shit. And they pull me over for fucking uh, a box of dude wipes. For oh. dude wipes. Unopened fat pack of dude wipes. Oh, we have to swab that. You don't care about anything else that I have with me? That's no, insane. that's what we want yeah, to fucking dude, swab. Dude, a set of antlers, like... Since they break off an antler, you've got a freaking dagger. Yeah. You can just run with the cap and mow right. people over. Yeah. yeah, no. So, but it's that's a whole that's a that's a podcast in itself. I mean, I would take this. I would have taken this orc skull back as a carry on. If you if, if I had the capability, to take it. And, and, and I refuse to fucking euro another skull. Yeah, that is a horrible. Well, process. especially yeah. especially kind of. What I didn't I didn't realize with these with the difference between horns and antlers, like you know whitetail with antlers, like you don't there's have no to worry, there's no sheathing. I didn't realize that with these, like you actually when they you boil them you pull off the sheathing and get all the sh- junk and, out. And of borax the, doesn't affect it, which is interesting. Correct. It only does the connective mm-hmm. socket essentially. Yep. And, right. And and so you mentioned you said that the actual bone horn goes about. 30% up the antler, or the horn? Yeah, somewhere around there. So, 20 is there a pulp that goes all the way up? There's a pulp that goes further up. And that needs to be cleaned out. Correct. With a so coat that, hanger or something. So, that pulp's attached to that bone. Yeah. So, whenever you pull those sheaths off, it just, like, hangs down. I mean, no. it looks like, looks like a Santa Claus's hat. You know, just, like, Or a soft down. wiener? Exactly a soft wiener. He didn't okay. say that. You did. Okay. And... So then you got to clean all that up, and then there's a suction to dry it. Dry it out, mm-hmm. and you got to dry out the sheath. Tell your you tax services, take notes. Well, so when I talked to him and I told him it's they're like an antelope, he's like, "Oh yeah, I know." He like it, it's. And same. we're talking about we're talking about pronghorn. Is pronghorn. he like odd big horn sheep? All of it, it's the same way. Right. You have to pop off all those sheets. So, with, so with, with the odd Dad, horn, he'll, he'll figure it out. Right, yeah. He knows. He As soon as I said that, he knew what I was talking about. Um, so with odd Ed, like, cause it, or, or big horn sheep, because they're curled, like, mm-hmm. do you have to, like, unwind no, so it? No, so, like, on a... You have a nub. On, yeah, uh, it's, it's only, like, It's not that curled. Big. Okay. And then the rest is all just... Dead. Yeah, I, have, I have a, a sheep skull from Ireland that I brought home when I was a kid. And I found the the outer shell, the the sheathing shed, and I was like, "Does this make sense?" But it, yeah. No, yeah, interesting, interesting. That's what I, I can't say this on camera either. Never mind. All right, you've said a whole bunch of other things. No, no, this is like. Never mind. We'll talk about it later. (laughs) I'm really. The phrase "interesting" is a great phrase. Um. All right. So shit. What else? From this hunt. Let's talk about, real quick. Okay. You just moved to South Dakota. Yep. From New Hampshire. Yep. You still have a New Hampshire facility yep. that will continue running. Yep. You opened up a uh, facility in Grand, uh, Rapid City, South Dakota. Yep. Um, I'm in awe and really happy for you that the community in Rapid City did a ribbon cutting ceremony. You had the lieutenant governor come down and officiate the opening of your business. Yep. That is um, that is a community collective yeah. uh, welcome that reminds me of like 1950s proud America yeah. small business. For sure. And 
you know, I'm out of New Hampshire, you're out of New Hampshire, you'll never get that in New Hampshire. They don't give a flying fuck if you open a new business. But the community that you decide to open your business in, they welcomed you with open arms, and that was something really, really special. Uh, it, honestly, it touched both you know, Lee and I, um, my wife. Your mail order bride. My mail order bride. <laughs> uh, really, and I, you know, and I like when they were she's talking. She's gonna kill me. Yeah, no, she's gonna no, fucking she won't. kill she'll, me. She'll she'll play along. <laughs> you know, but that was something like as we were getting ready for the ribbon cutting, like they were talking about doing this, and it was like, oh, this is kind of cool, and like I knew it was gonna be special, but like, uh, like when I had to give my little speech during that, like I I choked up pretty hard just because like, so you know. You're on the front page of the newspaper. Front page of the newspaper. No one does that anymore in normal coastal America. They, South Dakota. But that's your problem is coastal America. Right. Yeah, it, it's completely different from coasts to yeah. more Small central. Small town, middle America. But, but so South Dakota is extremely pro-business and very pro-Second Amendment. They love their yes. guns. They love their guns. They love anything to do with guns, and uh, you know their their plans on on keeping their communities, you know, growing and thriving is by bringing, you know, good jobs and manufacturing and businesses in there. Proud U.S. manufacturing. Exactly. And the fact that your two A is like icing on the fucking. Exactly. Table. Right. That's the thing. We could be if we were just manufacturing in America, they'd be super stoked about. It. Then, you, like you said, bringing its two A stuff. It, that's the that's the sprinkling on there, and they're they're super excited, and you know, our business, it was just it was Lee and I we started it was just supposed to be a side hit business for her for her, and it's grown to this point. And we need to pay for ammo and guns. Right. Let's be real. We all started it to pay for our fucking hobby. No, I, I was working for a gun company, so it didn't matter. I didn't pay for ammo or guns, but Ruger sent him a fucking bill. Yeah, I know. No, dude. That's honestly that's the biggest thing that I missed from working for Ruger was, dude. You could you. Oh, we need to go run a test. All right, here's two thousand rounds of whatever ammo of whatever caliber. We don't want it back if you have leftovers. Uh, dude, we've shot so much freaking ammo. Probably shouldn't say this out loud. No, he's gonna care. blow the lid on people that work there. No, <laughs> no, no. Like no one likes a snitch, snitch. right? No, it was. Uh, but um, you're dead if you ever go back to New Hampshire. <laughs> no, like. So we look, you know, Lee and I. <laughs> you're second to process that. <laughs> we, Lee and I, you know, we have four kids, and we've all like we've kind of referred to it the business as our fifth child. Like it's it's something we started together and have like grown and nurtured and tried to build up, and uh, you know, to be welcomed into a community because of that business like that is something we've never seen before, never experienced, and and you know, when we started looking for an, an, an extra place to set up. We could have picked anywhere in the country. Like we literally, and I was like, it's close right. to home, though. You are from Wisconsin. Yeah, but but we could we could have went, we could have went, we could have went to Wisconsin. Like no, but South Dakota is way cooler than Wisconsin. Dude, I don't know. Have you had the beer and cheese in Wisconsin? Uh, I love curd. Dude. I love cheese curd. Right. That's but the, I could not live around those accents and not Wisconsin. be sarcastic <laughs> all the fucking Dude. time. No, so that's no like, offense to Wisconsin folk. I I love your goddamn state. But cheese and beer is none of it. I mean, it. I would just hunt Too grouse and walleye. Like, I mean, you never, you never, you've never been on a good on a good. You know, uh, the walleye. School, hunt. The walleye schools, man. When they're biting hard. Like, oh my god! I love when your Wisconsin comes out. Right. It's so it's sexual. No. <laughs> <laughs> I, I went from six to midnight. So. <laughs> Did you? <laughs> no. So Damn. that right. So I mean, truly, like, if I had to pick home in this country, it's Wisconsin, and we didn't like we picked South Dakota because like business friendly, two A friendly, amazing governor, and Wisconsin's Dude, too close geez. to Michigan. <laughs> kind of so let's be real, like. Yeah. Michigan leading over to Wisconsin. Fucking yeah. Wisconsin up. Let's be real. Minnesota, yeah. No, but Governor Is Nome's it Minnesota? kind of, Yeah, Minnesota's a Minnesota's got some interesting issues that they're working through. For I mean, sure. Yeah. But yeah. Is it Minnesota that's touching Illinois? Min- I thought Wisconsin's Min- Wisconsin. Man, I don't even know what the fuck America is. <laughs> Have you, did did you take geography? Um, so yeah. So I'm a coastal kid, so right. I focused on the coast. <laughs> on the coast. <laughs> right. So so down in the southern part of Wisconsin. I never memorized capitals. 
My wife's, by the way, this is really funny. My wife is from Worcester, and her favorite fucking show on earth is how the states got their shapes. Really? No, my wife. On History Channel. My wife loves state history and why the geography is what it is. Hmm. It's her favorite I'm, fucking thing, I'm, I'm and she is right there. scary pumped about it. And you're just like, I love you. Why are you so fucking pumped about it? She's like, this is so a great goddamn story. interesting, and I love it. I love it. I appreciate it. Yeah. No. So yeah, great. Illinois touches the <laughs> southern part of Wisconsin, <laughs> and so like Chicago blends into Milwaukee, and mm-hmm. like we just as if from if you're from Wisconsin, you, you kind of like. Milwaukee kind of sucks, and it should just be a part of Chicago. So, yeah, we don't count that area. Have and then, been... yeah, Minneapolis, like, kind of starts bleeding over into it, and, like, Minneapolis isn't. And all these opinions Have you ever been coming... to Geneva? No, I want to. Really? Yeah, I really want to. No, Geneva, Illinois. Oh. Okay, I was... No, no, no. Switzerland. Okay, oh, no, never no. Mind. I was no. thinking Switzerland. So when we, uh, me and my wife went to Chicago once. We went to Geneva. I want to go to Switzerland. We went to Geneva. So it was the coolest <laughs> fucking town in Illinois I've ever been to. They had the coolest downtown. It so was what, like, they had like three stores. No, it was like and not it was shot? like no, it was like Newberry Street in Boston. What? Paired with like P Town. Paired with like six. P Town. No, I'm I'm not in a weird way, but like. The, the walking and friendliness. Um, <laughs> Not in and, a weird way. Dude, and so they had this like... You don't know P-Town. Okay, so... I'll, I'll explain that one later. No, we'll, we'll explain later. So, <laughs> so they have this like normal middle America downtown with you know, almost like downtown here, but less Western, more middle middle America. Yeah. And then... Um, more alternative. Then there's like first, second, <laughs> third street. And these streets go like three miles west. And each one of them is like an apartment up top a business there and a downstairs business and they had distilleries whiskey bars um like touristy shopping places and you could spend a day on each street and then get fucked up too and we're like man this is like way cooler chicago like we could spend like let's go stay in airbnb here and just fucking get fucked up and walk around for three days and call it a weekend like geneva (laughs) was one of the it's a it's a scandinavian population uh town and it's cool as fuck west hmm. of Chicago. And it beats the shit out of the burbs. Hmm. Now, I've been to Woodstock, and that's pretty badass up there. In just north of Chicago. <laughs> <laughs> Dude, Chicago's... Like, nobody likes Chicago. All right, let's not talk about Chicago. This yeah. is... We're Chicago, diverging well, here. But, yeah, so... Chicago. Let's talk about quality. Right, so... So you moved to South Dakota. You're really happy. You have two... And you also have Coltac Europe. Yeah, we haven't. So that, this technically is our third. Really? Faci- yeah, we yeah, he, third facility. He's so, a Latvian uh, yeah, manufacturing so, shop. Right. So so yeah, we have a third. This is technically our third facility. First one was in New Hampshire. Second one was in Europe, in Latvia. Global brand. Worldwide. That's what global means. Right. But I want. But I like, like hearing worldwide. Yeah, I like sounds, global. I feel like global is nah. so much more impactful. Well, and you know. They're in charge. Worldwide's of... like the white people definition of global. I'm offended. <laughs> I, I don't know why. Also. I don't know why, but I'm, I'm offended. offended. Um, no, but like they're in charge it's very of very many... racist, right? White people ruin everything. <laughs> they're in charge of making everything for Europe, and we just make everything for everywhere else. And... But yeah, it's uh... <laughs> I'm trying to be serious here, man. Uh, it's really hard after. Well, why? <laughs> all, all I can think of is like a rap song where they're in the background, like hyping. I'm I'm thinking of Step Brothers the whole time. <laughs> we say worldwide. <laughs> oh I yeah, what's like worldwide business? web or fucking where in the world Prestige. is Carmen San Diego? Prestige worldwide. <laughs> Prestige worldwide. Yes. <laughs> Boats and hoes. <laughs> I just I just personally think of a professional global brand, you know. Dude, and I'm just like. A redneck, like, trying to sew stuff together. Yeah. Uh, I'm having fun. But we've got big plans. So you do a lot of civilian side. You do do military law enforcement. Mm-hmm. Yep. Uh, we share a U.K. distributor. Yeah. You're welcome. Thank you. <laughs> well, no, but, like, so I will say, like. Hey, I, do you know someone that makes suppressor covers and fucking handguard covers? Yeah, I got a guy. Dude, no. I, 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 
I'm so a tactical you, matchmaker. You can go right. Fuck no, yourself. I well, no, like, <laughs> dude, I've gotten some really good. So we are friends on a personal level, but business wise, like sexual. Well, that, I didn't. I didn't think we were going to talk over about the that. Pants, hand jobs. <laughs> Our wives approve. Over the pants. I haven't done that since middle school. <laughs> what? <laughs> Don't talk about underage shit here. Jesus. Who was all well, I was middle school too. <laughs> no, I know you are. I'm just saying like that's that's traumatic for some people. Alright. Wow. I just took a turn for the dark. Edit that out, Jorge. <laughs> He's like, God damn it. Uh, no, we're gonna timestamp like, this not. <laughs> no, like Dude. Finish your thought. Well, I was gonna say, like we're friends personally, but like It's hard, I know. <laughs> business wise, like I think we both do, uh, at least I feel like, uh, you know, you've been a great friend. Fuck you. Um, dude, this bottle, <laughs> this, tequila, is over. <laughs> this bottle of tequila gets lower and lower, and I'm getting more and more uh, flustered. <laughs> what you, he's trying to say is not I only on a personal, but on a business level. I love you. He's okay. got nothing but love for you. Yeah. Um, you. You've made a lot of great significant life events change in your life recently which have made you a lighter weight drinker <laughs> yeah yeah um yeah you can't keep up anymore i can't no you're, I don't. you're soft as baby shit when it comes to drinking yeah you drank two four percent tapo chicos today and had jorge drive your car i'm like yeah i'm like <laughs> you're that's what i'm drinking now so yeah i feel like you're a secret drinker in the quiet of your own home when the babies are finally asleep the wife's like, I'm fucking sick and tired of you having a deployed person fucking lifestyle. I go lift, hunts. go lift the top off the tank of the toilet and I pull my beer out whiskey. of there. <laughs> so, it, and also we'll do a shout out for Aaron. Aaron also owns a roofing company. And if you are a quality roofer in this side of the fucking state, <laughs> he is looking for help. Since I'm no in. one here wants to actually work. I'm hiring. Aaron is hiring Bauer Roofing. Bauer Roofing. Bauer Roofing. Um, in this 505. No. <laughs> but seriously, he... Okay, for real. Um, Who roofs in New Mexico? That's Aaron like... will suck a dick for a dollar. <laughs> yeah, that's what <laughs> Guaranteed. Okay, so, so Aaron, like, real talk. We, um, t- t- uh, yesterday when we shot our animals, right? Yeah. Uh, y- the... Like most animals, including squirrels, oryx are most active from sunup to... Uh, 10 o'clock yeah. and then during the day they still roam um, forage whatever but yeah. um, they, they'll move they, and graze they'll move and graze but, but they're not as nearly as active they're, Correct. they're not as nearly as active as beginning of the day and end of the day and so in the middle of the day while we were all being lazy pieces of shit napping, napping. <laughs> napping Aaron who didn't sleep was roofing in 99 <laughs> degree weather here in mm-hmm. Truth or consequence, uh, consequences. Sorry, T O C T O R C. Sorry again. T O C works. No, it's T O R C. If you're from here, it's T O R. But but can you just say T O C? No. T O R C. Everyone says T R C. Only Orsi. Orsi sounds like horsey, and I don't like it. T O R C. So. In between our hunts, he was roofing, and on our way before we shot both of our animals, he his eyes were redder than the devil's dick. Like, yeah, he just smoked redder. a fat doobie, and he's like, I've been roofing this entire fucking time, and I'm fucking smoked. And um, so Aaron is probably one of the hardest working guides I have ever met in my entire yeah, life. And he doesn't spare. He doesn't he roofs in New Mexico by himself. I, I just say- the stupidest guy. <laughs> uh, by the way, his hours of operation for people that are looking for a job are morning and late afternoon, so you don't have to die in the heat. He will work while you take naps. <laughs> Jesus Christ. Um, <laughs> uh, hardest working guy I've ever fucking met, for sure. And uh, so if you're looking for a job in New Mexico and you want to build a career around your life instead of living <laughs> off the government dime, please contact Bauer Roofing. Call or if me. you need a roof. And you might fucking learn something about hunting, too, you fucking lazy sons of bitches. Whoa, hold on. <laughs> Whoa, I can say that. This is his podcast. <laughs> All right. I, you can say whatever you want. He doesn't need us to advertise his guiding ability. He's booked out for a year. Right. Might as well shout out his goddamn beautiful roofing company. <laughs> beautiful He's got a gorgeous brand new 250 that needs work. 
Not needs physical no. work. Needs to work. <laughs> no, I no, it's, it's, it's his, gorgeous. His it guns like shit. No, the hunting truck is the one that needs work. <laughs> yes. No, but you're, but it's good. Um, and this is our public apology to your wife. <laughs> this is our public apology to your wife. Sorry for bitching about your hunting truck that the doors don't work. Didn't work. Didn't they, work. They will work. They so, will work. So he rehabilitated a, an F-150. Was that F-150? Mm-hmm. Um, that was you know, a new transmission that was left to collect dust. And unfortunately, the dust disabled the rear door locks <laughs> if you roll down the windows. So on the morning of... <laughs> Our Very hunt. true. Um, when we was like, can we hop out real? He's like, you might have to jump out and shoot. And we're like, we fucking can't. But the best part was, every time we roll up the windows and we'd bump along a little bit, either um, our the cameraman, opposite. Jorge, our cameraman, would be on one side, and every time, me, the shooter, would be on the side of the car, the truck, that wouldn't fucking open, and then, like, a window would freeze, and then it would just, it was like, it was like musical fucking chair you doors. switch, and the door that <laughs> the would door. open would be, always be on Jorge's side. And I'd be side. like, Jorge, uh, I need to climb out your side, and Jorge's a yard sale when it comes to camera gear. It'd be like, Black Magic, Sony, um, his, Don't his, the drone. His, his drone, robot goggles, <laughs> and, and then a bunch of dildos he hides in his backpack, and so you have to traverse this lightsaber mess uh to get out and, and obviously jorge's worried about the shot so um i can't get out and fucking shoot shit um so luckily um, i like how he kept his door open though, he did, 80 he did. percent of the hunt after <laughs> he, so. he, he put a rag on the handle yeah, yeah. and then and then we were fucked because then my door would never open and then we didn't switch doors because he's a selfish bastard open. but he turned black from the door seal he did the window seal failing yeah um so it was like a clown car in the morning when we were chasing those two so big loud. animals. It was so but, awesome. Um, you know, Aaron's a great guide, and he sacrificed his personal beautiful work. Yeah, I like the transition into that. No, but you know what? Leather you know what? seats, Okay, AC. so real talk, real talk, real quick. The only, let's just say the only, and to your wife's avail, the only reason why we shot those two animals later in the day is because we were in your work truck. Going slow. And you were yeah. babying the fuck out of it. Yep. And, and you were moving maybe a max of three miles an hour versus the 22 in your yes. beater. Yeah. And um, those Oryx didn't get spooked. They thought we were a slow passerby. <laughs> and when we happened to look behind us for some yeah. reason, we yep. saw those, we saw those animals. Yep. Yeah. And, and the silver, they probably thought it was a larger, maybe their mother. They're like, Oh, <laughs> mama's going by the salt lick. Real slow. Now, actually, salt. we didn't talk about that. You, um, you did actually have a salt lick on the two track that we were, mm-hmm. were driving on. And you were blown away that it took three months for that salt lake to be gone. And And you saw you saw fresh tracks because you had heavy, heavy rain two days prior. Mm -hmm. And you saw fresh track and you said, Holy fuck, those are probably this morning. No, they were probably thirty minutes ago. Yeah, Yeah, it's hard to tell. Super fresh. It it is because of the rain, how hard is it to tell track? The soil out there is very tough (laughs) to be able to tell. In, it's almost like a chalky clay, yeah, yeah. but it there's it sinks. There's a lot of ants, and yep. you step, and you can get some real deep sinkage and yep. real light sinkage. Yeah, like no one cares about that. Why I mean, fuck I even talk about you ants? can, I mean, you can tell uh, if it's like within a day, and I mean that's a that's about it. Like that's I mean, the dust kind of the dust and the yeah the because there's so much over. wind that we get out, and like when we were out there, it was windy. Right. You know, the whole afternoon it so was So if you see the footprints kind of filled in a little bit, you know it might yeah, be from like, a day or two ago. Correct. So, like, I mean, it was windy and there was stuff already blown into it. Right. So, I mean, I knew it was relatively fresh. Like, it wasn't a day or two old. Right. But it also wasn't, like, ten minutes old. So, has this rain actually helped your guiding this year because of the intermittent rain between your hunts? And this is the first hunt that i've actually had on my ranch with this much rain with yeah within the last like four months okay so these four months has it been infinitesimally easier to track animals because of the intermittent rain that's a big word yeah I, real talk like um yeah i mean there's because there's washout because you're you're able to see like we were able to go out in two days prior there was rain so you know that within the last two days, any tracks that we're going to see are two days at least. But, 
that the oldest. Last two days fifteen old. years, it hasn't been that way. Correct. It so you could see tracks since that were, like oh six. We haven't had like we've been in rain. a terrible drought. So if you have no wind and an animal goes through an area prior to this year, those tracks could be preserved enough that they look For the same day or yeah. weeks old. Yeah, absolutely. So, so in helps. in. In retrospect, this year might actually be easier for your guiding season. Yeah. So During the rain hunts season. With, so. Book <laughs> fucking hunts with Aaron because it's so goddamn wet. <laughs> no. This season. We're not coming back till next season. Shut the fuck up. This season's booked up. He's going He's going antelope hunting next week. Why are you week? speaking for him? I'm not. I'm just he saying. He can. I, I, my wife does. Yeah. Everybody <laughs> my, does for me. Okay. My parents. Sense. Antelope hunting. My kids. I shouldn't say that. My two year old speaks for I'm me. Sorry for that. Then he's like, he's going on like <laughs> some, you know, weird Mexican, you know, chupacabra hunt. That's, that's rude. What? Chupacabra? So you do, you do, okay, so your, your three territories or three, well, we States. can't call Mexico a state, but yeah. you do Mexican uh, mule deer, and coos deer, coos deer, and coos. turkey hunts. Yep. Gold's turkey. Um, in Texas, you do axis, mule deer, what else? White tail, white tail, and Audad, and Audad, which is scimitar, that? black buck, scimitar, Nilgai, black buck. Like if yeah. it if it has hooves, you'll yeah. kill it. Except Nil guy, apparently. We can do Nil guy as well. Oh, you, I asked you earlier. You said no. I don't. Oh, you don't. I don't. I haven't hunted them, but oh, I've okay. got access to them. But you have access to them. Mm-hmm. Okay, cool. And then, um, and then New Near Mexico, Port Aran- Aransas. Near Port Aransas. Port Aransas. Texas. Okay. And then and then species in New Mexico that you guide for? Every big game species. Every big game species. And you do a lot of elk as well. Elk, antelope, mule deer. Orcs, obviously. Orcs, coos deer. <laughs> Fuck you. <laughs> no, I'm looking forward to our okay. hunt in two yeah. months. Because I'm going to not have any balls left. For like elk. What about so. our hunt next year? Thanks. Thanks uh, for leaving me out. <laughs> I am definitely looking forward to yeah, that. Yeah, so I am like coming back in two months to go hunt elk. With. I'm jealous because you're gonna dude. fucking fondle and gargle, dude. Muzzleloader elk. <laughs> he doesn't say. Ah, uh, it doesn't. So you're me. okay. So you're coming back in a couple months. Yeah. You, you drew a tag for, in New Mexico yep. for elk, and Aaron, coincidentally That's... enough, is going to be your guide. You right. went through a outfitter. Yep. And Aaron is your fucking guide. Right. And I've heard. Guaranteed 450, 450 inch bull elk <laughs> at fifty yards. So, so who's the outfitter that you went through? So you might give me a discount for this wonderful podcast. <laughs> Wild Out Pro, Wild Derek Out Martin, Pro. Derek Martin. Yeah, Wild Out Production. Wild Out Pro. Yeah, yeah I heard he has to pick a pair leg to put it down, and he will put you on animals with Dude, Eric. So I went. No, I went. So in March, I was out with him, and we went. So happy, no one laughed. <laughs> <laughs> I went to, he uh, got us on trout fishing, my daughter and I. Yeah. And, yeah. He got us on trout fishing. Dude. Which was fun, was it not? It was a great time. Like, honestly, just a verbiage were you able just to see of... all the trout in the water like, it was, when you were on the It was water? freaking wild, like, to see them, like... like <laughs> Fuck you. <laughs> he put us on trout yeah. fishing yeah. like it's a big game species. Like, he Honestly, put us on tra- them elk. It's like, no, he put us on them trout. There was, what, Texas, ho- Texas, Texas Hole? Texas Hole. Texas Hole. We were in Texas Hole. Yeah. Which is the best trout, trout fishing on the San Juan. And so now like, it's going to be heard, overpopulated after this extremely stream it's, podcast. It's, it's All well six known. people are going to watch this podcast and go <laughs> trout fishing. Actually... Most of our podcasts have over 500 downloads. So all six people will You show. might sell something. Aaron might get a customer. Actually, no. I've already sold a give couple of people. Give me an employee. <laughs> give, give me an employee. I've actually sold two people on Aaron today. People that have been hitting me up for a guide that does, like, multiple species of animal yeah. in the lower southwest. Yeah. So No, but trout fishing up there was good. And that's how I got hooked up with Derek. Because... Yeah, it was a weird. I don't, it was super funny though, like how, how in a roundabout way we both ended up like coming yeah, together so twice. Like, yeah, yeah. But I'm excited. It's gonna be good. You've been doing a good job not slurring your words, and I'm proud of you, dude. Alcohol spread across. <laughs> less... I did alcohol. Alcohol spread across. <laughs> Dang yeah. it! I did so good. Son of a bitch. <laughs> 
less body mass makes a higher concentration of alcohol. I'm proud of you. You've done an amazing job. You've killed it. Yeah. Working on your physical fitness. You're a svelte individual. I feel better. Yeah, when you told me about that today, I'm very proud of you, man. Uh, That's pretty awesome. It took a spider bite and me yelling at him. You're right? A spider bite. We've never talked about that publicly. So, a couple uh-huh. years ago, Dustin and I were shooting a PRS match up in at Ridgeline, uh, Team O'Neill Dalton. And uh, he was like, man, the back of my leg really hurts. I got bit by a bug or something. And I looked at it, and you had two fang marks. Like, yeah, you could see that. You could see, like, where the flesh was starting to deteriorate around the fang marks. And it was a little pimple. And I said... That looks like a fucking spider bite and not a nice one. He goes, no, nah, it's fine. So we shot the first day of the match, like no sleep, got fucking drunk the night before. You did. I was on the, I was already not feeling good, so I didn't drink. Okay, so I got really fucking drunk. Yeah, I you was did. sweating booze out the whole day on my first match ever, like real, real match ever. And um, we, we did about five miles hike that day. No, three miles hike, but it was traversing, a, traversing about a thousand tough. feet. It's a tough walk. On goat trails yeah. while carrying 60. And they didn't provide water or food at that time. Right. Uh, that oh. early. in that, So we had to carry about 60 pounds of gear and a ru- plus a 30-pound rifle, ammo, your tripod. And we and we, we circulated one tripod per squad. Um, so there were like six people squads or eight people squads. Cool. So yeah, Christy, Christy oh, so Larry was also starstruck from Christy. And she was the most professional she was the most professional professional yep. I have ever met. She was extremely courteous, cordial, and inviting to anyone that ever met her. Yeah. And I admired her uh, tenacity behind a rifle and the way she handled um, personal relations. Oh, yeah. I thought it was great. She she is super friendly. Um, so long story short is Dustin has <laughs> Yeah. And I was like, Dustin. Black Widow. Black, Black Widow. Well, we didn't know yet. Pause. Yeah. <laughs> I said, Dustin, um, so we got back that night. We went to Crapple Bees after having dinner, and um, I had multiple drinks. No, we went drinks. to that shitty Mexican place with the Ke- the Kebley guys. No, that was, oh, yeah. shit, that was day, no, that was day two. We no, I, did, I was gone. I was dead day two. I wasn't there day two. Well, we went there a day early, by the way. Right. No, you were a bit the day early. So we went a day early to mingle with people, get zero. He was bit then. We went out and drank. We went to, what's the um, beer, brewery? Sure, Shara, Shara. There's a brewery there. We yeah. went to the brewery, went to Crabble Bees. He went to bed. Next day, we shot our first match. He was starting to feel sluggish and shitty. Uh, that night, we ended up going to the Mexican, Mexican. steakhouse or whatever yeah, yeah, yeah. with the Kelby's dudes. And he was like, I'm not drinking. I feel like shit. And we went back and he goes, I go, let me look at the back of your leg. And it started turning to chronic. Like black. around, around. So he had a, a six inch purple line going across the back of his leg. And this was in the ditch of his knee. And the spider bite area was starting to go into chronic. It was turning black and peeling away from the fat. Um, and I said, gross. dude, you need to call your fucking wife or you need to go home. And so he was <laughs> like, well, I'll, it's fine. I'll sleep it off. And I'm like, <laughs> sleep off necrosis. <laughs> I was like, you need to go to like urgent care tonight. He goes, no, it's fine. So we're sleeping in, you know, queen beds next to each other. And Dustin's going like hyperventilating and then stops breathing for three minutes at a time. And I probably let this go on for like 20 minutes before every time he stopped breathing, I would yell, Dustin, wake up. And he would snap. Oh, okay. And then he would start hyperventilating and then stop breathing. So finally, I think you poured yourself like a cold bath and called your wife yeah. and you laid in the bath that you were vomiting yeah and bad. and so you went to the doctors the next day with your wife like early well so i called her yeah and with all four kids she drove up the two and a half hours picked me up and took me back home because you had to drive my fucking boat of a van back home that was horrible that's a big van <laughs> it was a big van like and a pedophile van? No, 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 like a Sprinter, like Batmobile. Van. No, it was a Nissan van, like the big Nissan commercial yeah, van. Yeah, giant commercial. They're van. awesome when you want to haul. It a lot feels of, like you're driving a boat. If you want to haul water. a lot of kids and ammo in a vehicle, Nissan kids vans. and a- ammo, the two prerogatives. <laughs> That's that literally vehicle. what I said when I walked into the dealership. I'm like, I need to haul dying? a boatload 
of kids and ammo, what's the best thing? They're like, we got the thing for you. Oh. Um, but yeah, so she drove me home, and I went to the ER, and they got pissed at me because I was like, they're like, you should have been to us. Like, you like, almost had kidney our... renal failure. Yeah, yeah. they, they had told to you you were like hours, like a handful of hours on one hand from kidney renal failure and they lots of organs. Yeah, they so they slapped me on a bed and pumped me full of weird fluids and felt like a rock star. After it was that. probably yeah. IV antibiotics, uh, semen, semen. <laughs> Yeah, and then I drove I your boat way back. better after that. <laughs> you left, you left the key in the gas cap and left all our guns in the fucking truck. Yeah, dude, I was out of there. I was like, I gotta go. I'm gonna die. And then I vowed that I was never going to drive up with you again. So Dustin lived in the western part of New Hampshire, and to get up to this place, <laughs> I drove, right. I drove an hour and fifteen minutes to his house. For me, to the sh- the range is an hour and forty five minutes from my house, and it's two so, and a half hours from the, my house from to the his range. house. So it was like four hours total. Yeah, and I was still he thought driving. He, he thought he was cut. He thought he was going to save time to drive to my house to go up to the no, range. No, we had to drive through fucking Vermont. Right, <laughs> it's so bad. I hate the roads out there. They're so bad. It's such a horrible place to live. No wonder why you moved south. Okay, we can't say that either. You, you said it. You <laughs> shot <laughs> still in fucking Newport. So anyway, this was our first in-person, yeah, on location episode of A and R Design Unholstered. Yep. Episode eighteen. Um, our guest today, Dustin Coleman, owner of Coltac. Uh, Aaron Bauer, our fantastic guide. Um, if you need to find contact info for Aaron. Can we just do your Instagram? Is that cool? yeah. So that's Aaron Bauer 32 yep. on Instagram. It's his personal Instagram, so be respectful when you send him DMs. No dick Bet- pics. <laughs> this is a professional you fucking video. <laughs> uh, so yeah, that's just what be res- to tell. Shut the fuck up, Dustin. <laughs> uh, just be respectful. It's Aaron's personal Instagram, so don't hound him, but he will. he's a busy man. He's busy roofing in between guiding. Um, he will get back to you. Uh, he's got great rates. He's got great access, and he's got a, a fairly high success rate. Yeah. Just for everyone that's aware, uh, Dustin and I getting our animals in tandem is extremely rare. Yeah. Uh, you said there's like a thirty-five percent success rate. rate. Success rate on off range. Forage, off, off yeah. range. And again, off range means not on white sands where there's a lot, a lot more animals and less pressure. Correct. So getting um, off range oryx is extremely low. And the fact that we got tandem is probably 5% maybe. Absolutely. So extremely special for both Dustin and I. We've always wanted to hunt together. Um, This was a, uh, an elevated bonding opportunity for both of us. We, we secretly love each other and. A romantic bag. I think it's pretty public. It's, not secret. It's, definitely it's getting not public. public now. It's yeah. public now. Um, and our wives are very well aware of it. Uh, so it, it was, but but really, it was a very special hunt for both of us to be able to have that opportunity to both uh, tag out at the same time. Um, it all worked out. We got a good stock. They didn't know that we were there. Yeah. yeah. And. Um, and not to mention, we got the lovely exhilaration of crossing a grassy field on a cool afternoon uh, in rattlesnake territory. Ready for rattlesnakes. The, <laughs> the fact that we didn't even hear a rattler yeah. blows my fucking mind. Yeah. Um, so there was no um, extra element of danger, thank fucking Jesus. And, and, and when we were stalking on that, and I saw you watching your feet and the way you were stepping, yeah. I started mimicking your steps. <laughs> and and then Dustin started going parallel to me, and I said, get in fucking line, rattlesnakes. And he goes, oh, sh-. He, he did the <laughs> yeah. oh, shit face and got behind me yeah. and was like, oh, fuck. And then Jorge, our lovely media director, was like, Oh fuck too, and then everyone got real tight behind you. Yep. After that, Which, and when I went back to the truck, I, you took your time. I took the same trail that I we have. went through the grass. So Jorge mentioned he goes, he's not even at the truck yet. I go, he's probably trying to walk the same track. Yeah, I because was. vibrations will scare the yeah. snakes yeah, off. No, exactly. So mm. you, in. And I knew that high grass in yep. New Mexico desert in summer, that's snake territory. Yep. That's where all the Let's rodents are. <laughs> are we going to go snake hunting right after this? I'll go. No, we need to pack. 
Let's go catch snakes. Yeah, I, I, I damn sure took my time going back, going yeah. on the same trail, making sure that. Yeah, because when I he's like, he's still out there. I was like, he's trying not to get bit and make this a production. Yeah, yeah. Um, and we got again, we got lucky. You were able to move the vehicle. Uh, we didn't have to. We didn't have to fill our game backpacks. Yeah. Other than Dustin testing something. Right. But he drove very nice and soft through very, you know, level terrain for his truck. Because he did, it's a brand new truck. <laughs> yes. And he treated it very nice. Aaron's <laughs> wife, his vehicle Just so is... you know, babe. <laughs> his... <laughs> All right, we're, we're done. This is the end of episode 18, on site in Truth or Consequences, New Mexico. Thank you for tuning in. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope the lighting comes out great because Jorge's an amazing editor. And um, apologies for Dustin and his lightweightedness for this. Love you, Alex. Buy, buy all of our shit and get guides with it, Aaron. And, and tell your friends he needs it.